we, we know about this. We've seen it years and years and years ago. But he talked about people going to hell and nobody blinked an eye. All the, all the people the people getting raped, nobody blinked an eye. All the abortion, nobody blinked an eye. But he, he said a cuss word, and I mean a little, I mean it was four letters. Yeah. It was, and the entire place rose to their feet. People got up and walked out. I mean, they were so angry. They were so passionate because this pastor said a cuss word. But the whole time you're talking about people dying and going to hell and people not being loved and they were, and they, have a, and they have no emotional reaction at all. Do you get what I'm saying? He purposely did that, and as they're walking out, he turned, he turned it around on them, and he humiliated that place of pastors. I wonder about us. Do we, when we see people in the corner, when we see people we pass, do, do we, if we knew where they were, if we knew their story, like Catherine was saying earlier, do we come out body? Do we come out loving? Do we come out fighting the devil? Will we stand toe to toe with the devil to save somebody? How well do we know ourselves? Oh, thank you. You ain't gonna know You ain't gonna know how to do it. Sit down. You ain't gonna have it. I'll be the devil at it first. In the ancient world, Know thyself was written on the fourth court of the temple of Apollo at Delphi, where Greek philosophers laid the foundation for the Western culture as we know it today. This is kind of a picture of the ruins there, you know, where they used to sit and philosophize. And it really has become the culture, the way we think, the way we process, the, the intellectual thing. Now, know thyself in psychology, it has a different meaning. Okay? All right? They call they don't. They don't call it know thyself. They call it personal intelligence. Now, what is that? It, I got this from a Psychology Today article. And since uh, Shelly's in school to be a psychology major, I'm going to have her read this. <laughs> this, is, this, is a, this is know thyself. They're what, personal intelligence, <laughs> the definition, basically. Okay. People who display such an ability understand themselves and know who they are. They evaluate others more accurately and therefore make more allowances for others. <laughs> they are better at acknowledging their own limitations, too. Those who are talented at this reasoning power make better guesses about how people are likely to behave. And they have a generally good idea about how their acquaintances, colleagues, and friends perceive them. They know their own reputation. Yeah. I think we all believe we know ourselves. But sometimes our spouses know us better. We know ourselves. Sometimes our congregations know pastors better. We know ourselves. Sometimes we know about everybody else better than we know ourselves. Um, but I wonder what do what do people see? What do people think? If we think we know ourselves, and other people look at us, do what they see and what we think about our do they match? Um, I thank you guys for the letters you wrote, the comments you wrote, the stories you wrote, the poems you wrote. Um, I actually finally Friday had time where I could un, you know, unplug from everything and I got to read your letters to me, your thoughts to me. And, I, and honestly, I was knowing, you know, this was in my mind. I didn't know at that point I had to do a sermon and stuff, but I wanted to know. I mean, I want to compare what I think I am, what I think I see to what you think and what you see. But here's the deal. It's been a rough week. And uh, Shelly was, um, Shelly had just come back from out of town and she'd been in school and stuff. Anyway, so I, I so all these things had happened. Why I call Shelly? Because I knew she was not working. I knew Friday, and she, and she answered right away. And I unloaded for the next half hour of everything that went wrong last week. This is the week I have off. I can get all this administrative stuff done. I can get my wits about myself. Me and Nana could have the weekend to go do things. I mean, we had it all. But everything went wrong. Everything. And while I'm telling Shelly this, I kept adding one and that one, and I'm driving down, I'm on, I'm on uh, interstate going towards Gaffney, on 85, and it was like my whole engine was blowing up in my car after everything else. I was like, really? I said, Shelly, I gotta hang up by. So I got on the interstate and figured all that out, but here's the deal. Um, it was such a bad day, so when I got home from all that, reading your letters absolutely brought life back to me. But the thing is, the devil didn't even defeat me. I wasn't even burnt out. I wasn't even angry all week. I was actually laughing about everything. Because I knew I was under spiritual attack. But knowing what you think about me matters. 
Not because I need it. Because really, I want to know who, who am I really? Do I know myself the way I think I do? do, do am I who I think I am to God? Because most of the time, we don't, we don't see ourselves. We don't know ourselves. We can sit and look at everybody else. This problem in Robert's life. This problem in Dana's relationships. This is the problem in Jason. This problem. But you know what? While we're sitting back telling everybody else's story, we can't see we're guilty of the same stuff. We can't see when we're broken. We have no idea we're broken. We have no idea we're angry. We have no idea we had you look like a fool. Until like 10 years pass and you look back at your life like I do sometimes. Like, I can't believe I did that back then. I can't believe I thought that. I can't believe I actually thought I had to figure it out there, and I was so wrong. So know that stuff is a big issue. Mary Ann, one of the things she wrote me, um, she put a verse in there, and it's a verse that I've used in here, and I know two different sermons about things, but I never saw myself in this verse, even though I'm talking about pastors when I've used it. And uh, but Mary Ann wrote this to me, Jeremiah 3, 15, and I will give you shepherds after my own heart, who will feed you with the knowledge, with the knowledge and understanding. Now, if there's two things I'll tell you that I know about myself, these are the two things, okay? One, I have a shepherd's heart. I will fight the devil for people. I might not fight for myself, but I'll fight the devil. I know that about me. And here's the deal, ain't nobody taking that from me. But, but you guys showed me with what you wrote. That came out over and over and over and over. The other thing I know about me is every week I tell you, I want to give you knowledge and understanding. I want you to understand the Word of God. I want you to see yourself in the Word of God. I want you to see how it plays out in life. I want you to know where and how. That way when you look at the TV, when you hear the politics, when you hear the lies, and this, you see it. You see what's good. You see what's right. Or there's a situation where you meet a person like Mary Ann and we just start talking about it. I don't know Mary Ann. But by the things she says, by the things you learn here, you know where she's at spiritually. You know where she's at emotionally. You know what to say. You know how to come at her. You have that story and that story. And you pile it in in that two-minute conversation. And she walks away. And it's in her head. And it's in her heart. And it will change her life. That's what I'm trying to put in this. If you can understand what you've been through and what you're facing and why God did it and where God's going with it, you can turn around and do that to somebody else. I have a purpose for why I teach what I teach. And that's why the, uh, when, well, that's why the, uh, the email that came in on Friday, uh, Friday, Thursday night, came in on Thursday night, was like, man, I, it would take me a year to explain to you why I preached that sermon, where I was coming from. And where it was going. Because you don't have the foundation. You don't have the history. You don't understand. You're just walking in and you want to judge. But I want you to be equipped to change the world. I want you to understand where God is. And you can't hear God or see God. I want you to understand that the whole world is destroying you. When you think you can't fight. And you can't stand. And you can't change things. That God, absolutely you can. Absolutely God is with you. I don't want you to even blink when the devil comes against you. I want you to do like Friday when me and Shelly were laughing. <laughs> That's all you got? Hook we'll car up. I walk. Anyway, know that stuff. <laughs> From this point forward, you have to keep me focused. From this point forward. That's going to be hard to do. Now, here's the deal. Uh, in my sermons and in my kind of leadership style, y'all know I deal a lot with, about current events, political issues, cultural issues. I try to absolutely listen. Here it is in the Bible. Here it is in the Bible. I don't want to hear your political view. I don't want to hear your non-political view. I don't want to hear your public view. I don't even want to hear my own. Here it is in the Word of God. Here it is. It's happened before. You think I'm talking about politics? No, I'm talking about a biblical worldview of what's happened. It's happened before. And honestly, it's God's answer. It's God's precept. It's God's principle. It's God's truth. Now, here's the deal. The Bible lays it all out. All right? Once it's laid it all out, when Jeff gets done preaching this sermon, you know what Jeff's got to do? He's got to leave here and live it. i got to leave here and make the choice about my own life. My own relationships, my own politics. Here's the truth. I may be opposite of that completely. But am I going to accept God's word as truth? 
Am I going to change to meet God's truth? Am I going to change my views of what's happened in the world? Am I going to be that kind of Christian? If I don't know who I really am, if I don't know where I stand, but here's the deal. You've got to go home and do the same thing. Every sermon. Not off of my opinion, just off of the word. But there seems to be no conviction anymore. No conviction. There seems to be no, you know what, I really need to change. It just seems like it's not there sometimes. So in a lot of ways, a parent will fight for their kids, and a pastor should fight for his people. But more than that, we should all fight for God. We should fight for God. Now, that being said, um, I told you to get me on my nose, right? You're doing pretty good on that. You're doing pretty good. Uh, <laughs> if, if, God has, if God has laid out the truth, right? And if what I do is between me and God. Do you agree with that? What I do is between me and God. Agree with that? No, by, by by standing here, I kind of open myself up to y'all. Mm-hmm. And here's the deal. At the end of the day, y'all are going to answer for my life. Mm-hmm. I gotta say before God, and here's the if I chose to believe a lie, I know the truth. Mm-hmm. If I chose to believe a lie, live a lie, and let myself be deceived, or even deceive myself, I made my choice. Mm-hmm. Here's the deal, you did the you did the same thing. Mm-hmm. If you chose to believe a lie, live a lie, if you chose to allow yourself to be deceived or to deceive yourself, then you made your choice. Now, Satan, the Bible says, is the father of lies. Okay? Right? Everybody knows this. The father of lies, another way to look at lies is lies always take you somewhere. If you want to believe a lie, something that's not the truth, but, you know, an illusion of the truth is what I call it. If you want to believe an illusion of the truth, then it's going to take you somewhere. And it always takes a person to the same place. You know, you can be in a marriage where my wife really don't hug me and hug me and she don't meet my emotional needs and uh, the girl next door does. The girl at work does. I can try to justify in my mind that it's okay to have that affair. I've built an illusion in my head or the devil has put an illusion in my head that it's okay to do that. I can get by with that. I can, I can, I can hide that. Or, I'm, I'm, you know what? I deserve that. Illusion of the, an illusion of the truth because it ain't the truth. So if you believe an illusion of the truth, it always leads to disillusion. Disillusion. If you come in expecting me to be the, the greatest pastor in the world, <coughs> living a perfect life, and you put a person on a pedestal, you are disillusioned from the start. Amen. Hmm. Now, disillusion is defined as a feeling of disappointment resulting from the discovery that something is not as one believed it to be. And the biggest disillusionment you'll ever find is that you're not who you think you are. I remember the morning I woke up thinking, I'm the, everybody told me I'm super Christian. Since my teen years, from about 15 on, I was super Christian. I didn't do wrong. I didn't cuss. I didn't drink. I was in the worst family. I ran to church. I ran to love. I was a good guy. I was bullied. I didn't attack back. I did right. The Navy was easy for me. It was good to me. I mean, I had it by the tail. And then one day I woke up and realized, I'm not that super Christian. That's hard. It's hard. Some church, churches walk on water. Some pastors present themselves as walking on water. I would be afraid to do that. Because I know God has a sense of humor. <laughs> for real. So how do, nobody wants to hit that, that feeling of dis, being disillusioned. How do you keep that from happening? How do you keep from believing something isn't real? Well, it, it's pretty simple, actually. Can't avoid a disillusionment. It's never to have become to have believe the illusion of the truth in the first place. If you don't let yourself be illumined, you know, if you don't buy into the lie and try to make it real, well, you never have disillusionment. It's pretty simple. Now, I, I, this is actually going somewhere. I've got to turn this way now. Now, the Bible talks about the biggest disillusionment of them all. Okay? Should be in the greatest fear of most Christians. And, um, and, uh, let's see, who got it? Malia. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only... 
but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil Lord. Can you imagine these Christians? They, these Christians got to heaven, and they in. They in. <clears throat> They bring you on the worship team. In fact, they play drums on the worship team. Just uh, <laughs> 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 Do you think they were in? They did all the Christian things. People got saved. Demons got casted out. They prophesied. They spoke truth to the people's lives. They're standing there. Yeah, I know I did. I did it all right. And Jesus says, I don't know you. I says, I don't know you. Apart from me. Can you imagine the disillusionment thing? Because that will last eternity. Yeah, you just you, you can't go home and watch well, cooking your best meal when you feel better. This is eternity. How many of us, how many Christians are gonna be that disillusioned to who they really are on this side of heaven, this side of eternity? And I don't want that to be us. I don't I don't want to be that myself. But I'm sure everybody, you ask them, they, oh, that ain't me. Huh. Now here's the deal about these Christians that this is talking about here. Because these are Christians that Jesus is talking about. They know. They in church. They cast out demons. They prophesy. <laughs> Who deceived them? Did the devil deceive them? <laughs> or did they deceive themselves? Or is it both? Combination. It, Jesus tells us. Not necessarily. You give up one? The question. Now, the Bible teaches us a lot of things to give us discernment, to try to wake us up from illusion. It's trying to warn us that something's coming and you need to look out for it. And these scriptures I'm giving you now are all scriptures that I have already preached on in here. So if I'm being evaluated, you know, well, I'm just going over what we've had before. All right, here we go. John 10, 10. The thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. If you ain't got that in the back of your mind, <laughs> when that phone rings or that computer gets turned on, Or when you got an opportunity to break into a house. <laughs> I was actually going to play third day thief this morning. Uh, <laughs> I am a thief. <laughs> I am a murderer. So yeah, I can't sing. So I was going to do that in your honor, but I forgot about it until right now. <laughs> the father of lies is trying to trap us. He's trying to deceive us. He wants us to believe in illusion. You know what? You can do this. It, it, it is, I, I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm, I'm not trying to kill you. I'm not going to destroy you. Just, just do this. It's okay. You know, bend the standards, Jeff. You know, hey, have a set of rules for your congregation, Jeff, and then have a set for yourself. That's what parents do, right? Don't do as I say. <laughs> Oh, no, don't do it. Do it. Thank you. Do it. Yeah, do it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There you go. Larry, what are you laughing at, Larry? Come on up here. Right back here, Larry. You can, you can rescue me, man. <laughs> First Peter 5, 8. Be alert to sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like everyone loves it. You're so to devour. Yeah. And you know what he's going to devour you the most? Is when you, hey, man, we just... We just, we see the world. I think, Gerald, yeah. You on top of the world? Boy, it's a long fall to the bottom. Yeah. Be able to look out. Right. First Timothy 4, 1 through 2. We've all heard these. Uh, the Spirit fully said in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits. Things taught by demons. They want to know it's a demon speaking to them. They don't know what a demon looks like. They don't know how they get these thoughts in their head. It's just their mind talking to them. You want to bet? Read your Bible. Such teachers come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Hey, if you're one of the ones that watches the, the news at night, you're better than me. You can't watch that. Lie, lie, attack, demon, vilify. I mean, unbelievable what they, what's going on in the world. Unbelievable. 
I'm a label. If you don't think that's from the devil, you're crazy. You're crazy. Help us this stuff. Matthew, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 12. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. Antichrist he will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. It's coming the ways that wickedness deceives the Come out, come out. Perish. How many of y'all are ready for the how many y'all ready for the signs and wonders that's going to deceive the Christians? Well what what if what if all of a sudden somebody descends from, from the sky? I mean, we see it, the whole world sees something descending from the sky. Is that Jesus or is that part of the Antichrist's trickery? The Bible's trying to warn us for this. We gotta be smart. We gotta be sharp because this is gonna happen. Read the Bible. I mean, half or two thirds of Christianity and, and Judaism are going to abandon God. They're going to believe the illusion, the disillusion. The, the, it's unbelievable. Are we smart enough, strong enough, in the spirit enough that we will know what's of God and what's not of God? I mean, Sarah, this is this is deep stuff. So when you watch that news, is that of God? Is this rebellion in Congress? Rebellion? Is that of God? Is killing cops of God? Is attacking a president and no respect, no honor? Is all of that of God? If you can't figure that out, you're never going to figure out the Antichrist. And we're susceptible to be deceived. Sorry, guys. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie, and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Mm. Wow. Yeah. It's going to happen. You don't have to believe my, my thoughts on politics. I'm giving you a biblical point of view of politics. I'm giving a biblical point of view of what's happening in our culture. You can choose to believe what the Bible says. You don't have to choose to believe what I said. You better listen to God. You better find the Holy Spirit. And you, then you've got to make a choice. Do I still stand behind that? Do I still believe in that? Or do I need to change and conform to who God wants me to be, who God has called his people to be? Or if you start compromising now, will that, will that play out later on? Well, you'll still compromise. You start a habit. It's going to become a lifestyle. Right? 1 John 4, 1-3. Marianne, go ahead. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Now, how do you get that? Well, this played out this week in, in, in the press. I don't know if you saw it or not. What's that? Duck Dynasty? Is that the show Duck Dynasty? I never really watched that. Remember the, uh, the people that looked like the Robinsons? Yeah, the Robinsons. Yeah, the Robinsons. Well, the grandfather was, uh, had a speaking at a conference either last week or earlier this week. He was speaking, and, his, and he and basically what he asked this uh, group, and he directed it towards a political party. He goes, "Do you do you even love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus?" And he was kind of, he was aiming it, and he spoke it directly at the Democratic Party. He goes, "Because of the your actions, but what you do, but how you talk, but what you're acting now, because I don't think you love him. I don't think you. I think you hate him." Tell me if I'm not wrong. I didn't listen to the whole thing. I don't, but. It's a question. You know, when you look at the evidence of what you see, you've got to ask questions. You know? And here's the deal. Do we love God? How do we know if we love God or not? Well, Jesus, they have to stop with that. Matthew 22, 37, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Okay? And this is how that plays out. Jesus is really laying out the hard truth. Here's the hard truth. You ready? If we truly love God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind, then we're not going to change the Word of God. We're not going to change the Word of God. We're not going to embellish the Word of God. We just change it for us. We're not going to change it. We just think well, it's okay if I do. We're not going to do that. We're not going to change what it says about homosexuality. We're not going to change what it says about X, Y, Z. We're not going to change what it says even if you're on the computer. By the way, the same, if, if we were to attack the gay and lesbian community, but you're a gossiper? You're a liar? You're on a pornography? Oh, this says all them won't make, make the heaven either. I sex, uh, any sexual immorality.
if we truly love God, and we know what the Bible says on something, if we truly love God, you know what we're not going to do? We're not going to do it. But if we do, you know what's going to happen immediately after we do it? You're going to feel conviction. You're going to feel guilt. You're going to feel even shame. And you're going to feel, you want to repent and make it right. Even if you've done it over and over and over and over and over. I tell people, when you get to the point that you keep doing it, that you no longer hear that voice, you in trouble, child. If we truly love God, according to Jesus, we're going to obey his word. And we're going to stand for his word even when the whole world turns against it. And that's true. So I'm not going to ask you today, do you love God? Because I know what you're going to tell me. But I'm not going to ask myself either because I know I'm just as guilty of a lot of this as everybody else. I've got a lot of growing. I've got a standard I need to meet. I do need to elevate. You know, it used to be that people had too high of a standard, you could never meet it. Now people just don't have no standard. Here's some stuff I haven't covered in church. It's all from Proverbs 14. Verse 1, the wise woman builds her house. <laughs> and with her own hands, the foolish one tears hers down. You know, what, you know what this is talking about? It's talking about self-destructive people. You build a house. You know, you build a ministry. You've changed your life. You, but you're self-destructive because something inside of you is broken. And you tear down your own house. You tear down your own reputation. You tear down your own, you guess your own is? Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right? It's disillusionment. Oh, we're getting too far into this. Verse 2, uh, uh, Proverbs 42. Whoever fears the Lord walks uprightly, but those who despise him are devious in their ways. And here's a question. Can things go wrong in a person's life that you get confused, get angry, that you can even despise God as a Christian? Yeah, absolutely. So the devious here, the word is actually lost. Those who despise him are lost in their ways. Most people love God who are who are most people who are angry with God actually love God. But they're so lost in their life. They're so lost in what has happened. They're so lost in what has been done to them. They're so lost in what they've done. They can't find themselves. They're confused. They're angry. And it affects them spiritually, but it affects them emotionally. I love these things two go together. Verse 5 and 25. Mary, how many you there? You can be an honest witness because you broke into the house. But you, you're honest about it. You admitted to it this morning. I trusted you. <laughs> but the, the bottom two. <laughs> an honest witness does not deceive, but a false witness pours out lies. And a truthful witness saves lives, but a false witness is deceitful. Okay, an honest witness. Like I said, watch the news lately. Every bit of that's bearing false witness. Every bit of that's false witness. Everybody watch that? I've told you about it before. There's a you know, TV show called Catfish. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, what, how does that work out? Is that you usually have a person who's hurting, broken, confused, or they can't have something, they're at a disadvantage, and they create an online IP, they steal pictures, stories, they make them sell them to something they're not, and they're looking for some, some unexpected young man or young woman that they can take advantage of for money. You know, they get in this long-term relationship, they never see each other, and you know, it turns out to be it's really a guy when you think it's a girl, or you know, it, it, it's a real what it is is the people that do this catfishing, they're trying to get something from you. Yeah. Emotionally typically. They're looking for a relationship, but they all they gotta be something that they're not to get it. And and to do something that you're not, you're deceiving people, okay? You're very false witness. Where is the guilty of false witness when you come to church and act like we got it all together? It's your very false witness against yourself, against the spirit in you. Oh, by the way, you got to do that in most places. Here, here, you don't have to do that. Hey, Larry, come in today and do a rock at me. I'm okay with that. At least I know where I stand with Larry today. If Larry walked in and kissed me on the forehead, patted me on the rump, you know, and he walked out and talked about me behind my back. Larry, hey, hey, come on, Larry. Thank you for throwing a rock at me. I love you, man. He really, y'all know, you know, he really throw a rock at me. Disillusionment. Disillusionment. Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way that appears to be right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. How many of us really believe the road we're on, the choice we're making is okay with God? In the end, it leads to death. Disillusionment. Uh, 34. Righteousness exalts 
consummation. But sin condemns any people. Disillusionment leads to condemnation. And verse 27 here says, The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. Disillusionment leads to death. I'm telling you. If you want to believe something that isn't real, you want to make yourself that something that isn't real, in the end it will condemn you, in the end it will, make, it will make you a fool, and in the end it can lead to death. You'll be out of church. You'll walk away from church. Well, here's the deal. Maybe you want the church to get love, but man, all they did was attack you. All they did was put you down. All they did was make fun of you behind your back. All they did was destroy your character. I mean, you had an illusion that this place is going to be different. Remember what I love you here. I was going to find myself here. Mm. 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 Now, here's the deal. I'm going to get really real on this. The world that we're living in today, we are being bred, conditioned, and programmed to fall, from, fall into the trap. I've seen your passion. Close. <laughs> Drew's trying to catch back up to where he was. Because Drew Jeff right. accidentally turned it off. <laughs> I was at a good moment. The devil got in the way. I think Drew did that. I forgot it. <laughs> okay. You can blame me. <laughs> yeah, it's Jeff. Y'all come up back, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Well, Thank you. Take the fall for us. That's a real friend. Take the fall for um, But seriously, we have been bred, conditioned to fall into the trap of disillusionment. Seriously. Most of us don't even know it. Every week, every week, Preaching, I do preaching, counseling, I try to speak the truth, I try to show how the devil deceives us. But then I gotta ask myself sometimes, does anybody really care? The biggest thing is disillusionment in a pastor is you preach for 10 years, you never see a real person truly change. You preach and you never see a real person transform. You preach and you never see a family <laughs> come back together. You share the truth every week. Being a pastor can be the most rewarding thing with God. But when you see family after family still fall apart, still walk away from God, still turn against God, you don't see people getting shouting and you don't see people making a difference. Dude, it could be a really forced to, it could be really, really disillusioned. Human history has proven, and when I say human history, I'm talking more Christianity here. That only a few people, few Christians, will actually hear the word of God, feel that conviction, know they need to change, and go on and change. Seriously. Alright? So, those who are wise enough, ready? Those who are wise enough to ask this question, this statement of themselves and of the word of God is a real wise person. When you hear that sermon, is this me, God? If this is me, show me. Rebuild my heart, mind, soul, spirit to myself. Don't let me become the disillusion. Don't let me be the one that falls into the trap, blind to the truth, and a slave to the darkness. Save me from myself. Save me from the spirit of deception that he is able to deceive even the children of God. And the children of God, he has warned, will be deceived. They stood before Christ and she said, I do not know you. When I preach a sermon, man, if I could get myself to look at what God has showed me and to give us and say that, to God, is this me? Am I guilty of this? Do I need to change? Do, 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 you know, don't let me become the disillusion. Help me not to fall from the darkness, the lie, the deception. Help me be the one, the few that are the wise, the few that hears it and can see it. Our problem is we can't see ourselves. If I can tell you all day wrong, what's wrong with Shelly? <laughs> but Jeff, you know, all this know thyself, that isn't scriptural. That's just something from Latin and Greek philosophers. You know, it's in the Bible. Here it is. 3 Timothy 4, 16. Paul says, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Two things we have to guard against. Your life. Watch your life. See yourself. See yourself with the eyes of God. Not the way you see yourself, but the way God sees you. Not the way you think you are, but the way the, the Word of God lays it out. See yourself. 
Also see yourself. And it says, guard against your doctrine. God's truth. Watch your doctrine. Because you know how easy it is to get, to get your doctrine all wrong? If you listen to the wrong people, you'll begin to believe all things you know are a sin or okay. You know, they've had a hard life. God knows they've had a hard life. You know, it's just, you know, God understands. Yeah, He does, but that doesn't give us a license to destroy ourselves, to sin, to just against God. It, it gives us the right to go to God for healing and hope. So here's the deal. Churches, we do a pretty good job at least talking about false doctrine. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, well, I can name different denominations that have gone by the, the wrong path, but what I'm saying is, is we preach on false doctrine a lot, and we teach people how to spot the false doctrine. So if a preacher gets on TV and says, Jesus did rise from the dead, you're going to know, hey, that's false doctrine. Yeah, seriously. You're going to know this. You should know this. You should know it. The basic, I mean, you'll, you'll see it. But sometimes what we don't understand. God created us as humans, right? With emotions, with feelings. We have real hurts. The things like jealousy, they happen naturally. Anger happens kind of naturally. All these things happen. It's what we do with them. It's how we respond to them. It's how we act on them where things get really crazy. But you know what we haven't done real good in a church? It is to teach people to understand how they're wired. Why do you think the way you think? Why do you act the way you act? Why do you respond the way you respond? If God made us, then emotions and feelings are of Him. Why aren't we? And that's the dots I try to connect every week. This is why you are where you are. This is why you're thinking this. This is how, oh, I get it now. I see how God works in that. I see where I need it. Oh, I got it. So this morning, the rest of the time that we have together, I'm going to dedicate to helping us understand uh, ourselves emotionally, okay? I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. Because in the end, this is what I want you to say to yourself. When I'm done with what I'm done with this morning, okay, with everything I've said, and, and especially what I'm going to say, I want you to ask, God, is this me? <clears throat> if this is me, show me. Reveal my heart, mind, soul, spirit to myself. Don't let me become the disillusion. Don't let me be the one that falls into the trap, blind to the truth, and a slave to the darkness. Save me from myself. <laughs> Save me from the spirit of deception. That is and will deceive even the children of God. And what Jason said this morning, the storm, praise the storm. Are you talking about that? Storm. Yeah, what was it? Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. But it brought you back. Yeah, okay. There's going to be a time where you might lose that. That's why when you say, when you hear something, that's not for me. That sermon's for Matthew. That sermon's for Robert. That sermon's for Shelly. Um, that we don't think like this. Now, I'm going to cover a little matrix, okay? And this matrix um, was developed by a pastor. Um, it's called uh, 15 Ways Hurting People Hurt Others, okay? Some of you, some of you who had marriage counseling with me, I went over it with you. Some of you have had uh, uh, personal counseling with me or mentorship. I went over this with people. Okay? Now, when I go over it, it's funny. I'm going to use a couple. Gonna, <laughs> oh, man, this is good stuff. I don't have permission to say this. Almost. I had a couple that we all know, and they're great people. <laughs> and it's funny. Most people go through it. That ain't me. 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 But this particular day, I was doing it for the husband in the marriage. He's a great son. He went, and, he, and as I'm going through it, shit, shit. and the more I went through it, the more he looked at the ground, under the table. He was trying to climb under the table. He's pretty tall. He couldn't fit. But, uh, <laughs> but he had self-awareness. Well, most of us don't have. We only have self-awareness for our spouse or our kids or everybody else. What I wasn't paying attention to was the spouse. She was checking off stuff too. And when I was done going through everything with him, and um, she had put one color for him and one color for herself. And she nailed him purple. But the surprising thing is he saw himself. Even more surprising was she saw herself too. And that was beautiful. 
So we'll go over this. This is the guy that put it out. He's a he's kind of a retired pastor, Joseph. You can say it's uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, he's a he's a he's also a doctor of psychology, you know, psychology counseling, all that stuff. Now, why do this? Because hurting people, maybe without knowing it, probably without knowing it, probably without understanding, hurt other people and they hurt themselves. I'm telling you, nine. 95 out of 100 will not see themselves. Not today. Not in the day we live. Okay? So, why are we covering this? Verse Thessalonians 5.23. May God himself, be the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to bring healing. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to bring self-awareness. I'm trying to get us, don't look at your spouse, Look at it yourself. I, get, I want you to pray, God, if this is me, show me. Oh, later on, God, when the bad things happen, if this is me, show me. Don't let me become a fool. Don't let me condemn myself. Don't let this lead to my spiritual death. Or don't let this affect my children. Or my grandchildren. Or my Christian witness. Oh, by the way, we got teachers in this room. You can use this for the kids in your class. You can use this as a as a as a as a ministry leader, worship leader. Uh, oh man! Anytime you sit down with somebody, this is going to help you understand why people do think act the way they do. Because emotions, most of us live in the flesh. Most Christians tend to live in the flesh. What does it mean to be in the spirit? We try to watch. When you're in the flesh, this is how people respond. This is the way we're white. So I don't want to miss this. I don't want to miss this. Some of us already know this, but some of these uh, uh, we use pretty regularly on each other. Uh, uh, me, and, uh, uh, me and Alyssa back there, she'll say, I'm thinking this, and this is why I'm thinking this, and I know I'm wrong, and I'll say the same thing to her. I'm not Leo, and I'll say it to Shelly. I know, but, I should, but, but I'm going to repeat anyway. <laughs> Alright, you ready? It's 15 of them. Some of these, you just want to read them and go. These are just how people act and they don't even know they act this way. Number one. Hurting people often transfer their inner anger, their inner hurt, their inner rage. Oh, wait, well, let me back up first. Now, who are the hurting? Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Uh, yeah, that's for the people on the left side of the room are. That's for the people at the back of the room. That's for the guy on the front row playing the drums. <laughs> who, 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 who defined hurting, Jeff? <laughs> I knew I'd skip something. Hang on. This is important. See if this fits the bill. If there is anything in your life that went wrong, anything, a relationship, a job, a time where you... If, if anything is went wrong, you could be emotionally compromised and don't know it. Okay? Um, because when you have things that go wrong, it changes the way you process it. It, it stunts the growth almost, all right? It causes to be blind reality to the truth in, in, in a particular area. So if you've ever been done wrong, been rejected, been abused, been abandoned, been attacked, left out, Verbally, emotionally, mentally, physically, or spiritually abused or rejected or attacked by anything or anyone at home, growing up, after you got married, school, at church, in public, in private, by a parent, by a friend, by a stranger. Maybe you did it to yourself. <laughs> if there's something you've ever felt at, a job, a ministry, I'd almost guarantee you that you're walking, walking around and you think you're well. But on an emotional level, the way you process things going forward, if you don't know this about yourself, you will process them wrong. So number one, hurt people often transfer their inner rage, inner anger, inner hurt onto their family and close friends. Anybody know anybody who's ever done that to you? They always take it out on the wife when they get home or the kids when they get home. Or a pastor takes it all out on his congregation sometimes. I don't know. Oh, man. Give her out to you here. 
Sometimes what you got to do is understand a person that's always striking out. You ever know, a person just gets angry and strike out all the time because they're always like, you got you got to avoid setting them off. Dana's looking at me, like not trying not to look at me because she didn't want to tell you that that was me when we got married. I had a lot of hurt. My, I had a lot of hurt. I, I just tell you, I had a lot of love, but I had a lot of hurt. And she breathed wrong or didn't say the right thing. It's like she was attacked. She didn't understand, and it can still come out to that. Because it's back there. This is what happens. Instead of, I don't want you to see your spouse. I want you to see yourself. Do you do this? Do you lose your cool? Do you blow your top? Do you, oh, okay. Number two, hurt people interpret every word spoken to them through a prism of their pain. You're like, if you, if a person has hurt in them and you say something, they're on the defensive, baby. You're against me. You're going to attack me. Uh, 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 the whole world's against me. You know, I know what they did when they said that. They were, they were knocking me down. I mean, you, you, it is so innocently because they take everything wrong, take it out of control, instead of process the spirit of God, they process it into their prison with hurt. And the other part is here, hurt people interpret every action. You know, you Naturally, without even knowing it, you're going to be cautious. Mary Ann walked in my house. I don't like pastors, and I don't like you. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. I don't trust pastors, and I don't trust you. I'm paying for his sins. You know what I'm saying? You know what happens when you get to your second marriage or your third marriage sometimes? You're punishing that mate for what the previous mate did. And you don't even know it. They're going through hell because you're filtering everything they say and do through what has been done before. Don't even know it. Number four. We had a part of me, uh, Hurt people often portray themselves as victims and carry a victim spirit or victim mentality. You ever seen a person with a victim spirit and victim mentality? This is a sermon by itself. <laughs> what was that for? I said, you need to go to the right for I'm not going to. <laughs> Hurting people who have not dealt with their hurt, if you don't deal with your hurt, you will always live your life as a victim. Okay? Shelly says, I did. Jeff says, I did. If you've been hurt, it is hard to enter in trusting relationships. A person that doesn't trust, I don't trust pastors, and I don't trust you. And she is honest with me. She she saw herself. She did. And she's like, you're going to have to come to some standard for me to trust you. And you're going to have to earn that, Jeff. Not because I did anything wrong, but I'm glad she, I mean, I was honest. But it's hard when you've been broken and trust has been betrayed. I'm going to keep going. Hurt people often came around a suspicious spirit. When others remind them of somebody or they, I hate when you, you remind me of this person or this pastor. I'm like, my, for you, my first thing is, um, tell me about that pastor. Because <laughs> my personality, you know, may be exactly like Larry's. But me and Larry may have two different, we have maybe two different characters. Uh, our character may be completely different. Our integrity may be different. And he was the previous pastor, and he did you wrong. I want you to give me a fair shot. I, we need to give each other a fair shot. When people come in the door, you gotta know they're broken. You gotta we gotta assume that maybe they, they are smiling and they love and they're hurt. When I look at Cisco, if Cisco never told me his story, dude, I'm gonna take him for face value, but at the same time, I don't know what has happened to Cisco's life. Or maybe, maybe, maybe Forrest walks in tomorrow and starts treating me crazy like talking about all this crazy stuff. I'm like, what's going on? And somebody said it earlier. Uh, uh, <laughs> Catherine says maybe those kids have been through something. Maybe there's a reason for it. If we don't think about this kind of stuff when we're dealing with the community, dealing with our children, dealing with our classes, dealing with the people we meet, we're never going to help them. We're never going to understand them. Most people with victim mentality can't see that they're attacking or damaging other people. And you know what happens when a person who's a victim, who's been a victim, who carries a victim mentality, I'm waiting for the shoe to drop. I know she's going to do me wrong. Here it comes. It's coming. It's coming. Just like everybody else. Here it comes. And when it does, and I'm blind to it, say I'm blind to it, then I'm like, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Uh, so she just gave 
her spirit of deception and illusionment and, and a victim spirit went from her into me because now I'm like messed up. And now I'm looking around like, I don't have my stuff for I've been attacked. And now Robert says something and Shelly says something and, and I don't know, Matthew says something and now I'm all messed up in the head because I can't make nobody happy. We pass these things on. It happens in personal relationships, professional relationships, intimate relationships especially. Um, try not to cover so much of this. Let's go get to it. If you want to know if you have a victim mentality, some of these might check out the blocks. It's everybody's fault. By the way, you won't see that you blame everybody. It's everybody's fault. You, you, you know, <laughs> everything that happens, it, it, it upsets you. By the way, you don't see that every time something goes on in the house, you stomp your feet, throw something at the dog. Or when you make comments to people that you love, like, you're going to leave me too. You don't love me. You don't want me. Nobody understands me. You are just like everybody else that did me wrong. Why does this always happen to me? If any of those have been you and you can remember saying those things or feeling those things, you have a victim's mentality right now. And it doesn't mean you're attacking other people with it. You're destroying yourself. <clears throat> because you're living in disillusion. You're living in the past. You're living in the hurt. And it will destroy you. And it will destroy your marriage. And it will destroy your children. And it will destroy relationships in church at work. First, with a victim mentality, they always have a reason, an excuse. Not to heal, not to change, not to face the truth. Well, I'm not to change something. Look at what Jeff said. I'm not perfect, but that's not what you, that's not your situation has nothing to do with me. Your situation actually has nothing to do with your spouse or your boss at work. Your relationship and how we live and who we are and healing comes from God. It's between you and God. Hmm. Hmm. Number five. Hurt people often alienate others and wonder why there's no one there for them. You ever seen a person that does that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Have you ever been that person? Oh, yeah. So this is the, this is the person who is a... A hurting person's default mode is everybody's against me. Remember? Next one. Hurt people have the emotional turn the age they receive their hurt. They're dealt with hurt. Anybody know what I'm talking about there? Yeah. Yeah. You know how they make jokes on TV about what your mother did? <laughs> it's your mother's fault. She didn't love you enough. She didn't hug you enough. Or your daddy didn't marry you. You know, your daddy wasn't. <laughs> I'll give you a couple of examples that explains what this is. And by the way, this is the first person I ever saw write this, and I know this to be true. You ever seen a grown adult? Act like a child, stomp their feet like a child, scream like a child, always angry, always blowing up, always losing it, always angry. Okay, this is what we're talking about. Let a trigger happen, which we'll talk about in a minute. Let a trigger happen. Okay, say it's a 12 year old girl. Let's say she was molested as a child. Now she's 40. Unless she has forgiven herself because she holds the guilt in her own self. Unless she's forgiven the person who's done it to her. Unless maybe they have forgiven God because they hold God. Unless forgiveness has happened. If something goes wrong in that person's life emotionally, you know what they're going to act like? Emotionally? 12-year-old little girl. That's where they stop going emotionally. Why does that person go to that like You don't even recognize it anymore. You're like, poof. That's what happened. And here's a better, here's a better example. Let's say... We got somebody um, like Mary Ann's future husband. He is highly educated. He is otherwise sane, except for wanting to marry her. Uh, <laughs> Mary Ann, you would be a good catch for some guy. He is a healthy individual. Well, let something happen in his life. This professional, highly educated, got it together. He's a doctor, lawyer. Uh, <laughs> let something go wrong. And all of a sudden, that guy that you love and respect and honor, you like, you don't, they, they freak out. Why do they freak out? Emotionally, they're acting wherever their dad left them. And what did that kid go through? You're nothing. You're nobody. You'll never be anything. You're not good enough. I hate you. I wish you were never born. You know? You ever heard these things? Some of us have. You know why we're successful in life? Because we're trying to get our self-worth. We're trying to prove our worth. Because somebody 
abandoned us, rejected us, told us these things, and it just absolutely weren't happening that first time we destroyed you. And that's why when somebody else does it to you, you act like that 12-year-old kid, that 5-year-old kid, whatever. Whatever age it happened. That's why counseling has to go back to the beginning. And you have to face that thing. You've got to find out that you are worth something. You've got to undo that. And you know why you go back and undo it? So you can move. Right. So you can grow. That's right. I can preach all day long and we can shout all day, amen all day long, but until healing happens, it ain't going to happen. Her people are often frustrated and depressed because past pain maybe spills over into their present consciousness. I'll say this. Some of these, some of these overlap with each other. Um, I've had to say to people, I'm not your dad. I'm not that last pastor. I'm not your last friend. Stop treating me like I'm the enemy. Shut up. <laughs> Number eight. Shut up. Hurt people often are wrong with inappropriate emotion because particular words, actions, or circumstances touch and trigger past wounds. This, why? Oh, this causes them to project the past into the current. That's why I won't let people, I don't want people ministering. You're, you know, you're ugly, you're this, you're that. They're the voices that maybe you heard growing up, but there's things that says, you know, I can't do this. And these are, these are just, this really isn't your conscience talking to you. Yeah. More often than not, it's a demonic spiritual attack. Amen. Amen. It is. We just don't realize it. Now I'm going to say this. I am convinced... <laughs> That most of the divisions in church, where churches split, where pastors and people split, are caused by Christians who lack emotional health. They aren't healed. They won't heal. Right? They want to cope. And they want to project their pain on the others. They want to create a vision to create holy followers of themselves. If I watch a person who's, at some point, a broken person has to have value. A person who's got a demonic foothold at some point has to have value. And what they're going to do is they're going to try to pit whoever the object is of their frustration, they're going to try to pit people against that person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me surround a group around me that's against them or even the whole church. And you'll look like they're maybe everything that they say that is the issues they're that they that they're making this decision for. Well, this ain't right, and this. Well, you know what? It might not be. I'm not perfect, but you ain't either. But you know what's really going on? They're hot. They're running. They're broken. They can't heal. They won't heal. They don't understand, even if you try. And so, eventually, you got to have self work. So, if people are on your side, on your side. That's what happens in most churches. you got people who are angry and hurt. And where did that come from? Did it start when they walked into the church? No, it started long before they walked into the church. Did it start when your marriage started? No, you brought it with you. From your childhood or from life. Now that being said, we're at number 14. God often purposely surface pain so hurt people can face reality and heal. All right, all right, I'm going to read that for me again, real loud. Who can read real loud? I want everybody to hear it. Matthew, Matthew. Look, real loud. God often purposely surfaces pain so hurt people can face reality. We think pain's, we think pain's a negative thing. We think pain is, you know, I, I can't show my... No, God will surface pain. Well, God's against me. No, God's trying to heal you, baby. That's right, that's right. You think you've got it hid? You think you buried it? Well, it's coming out one day. God's going to service it one day. It's going to be a supernatural move of God. And you're going to wonder why it came out that day, why that happened. God knows what he's doing. Right. God knows we don't face it. It don't change. It don't heal. It will hold you back emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Right. And as long as it's buried, as long as it controls you, you are not under God's control. You're not under the Holy Spirit's control. Because anytime that emotional trigger happens... And the moment you're getting close to God, you're doing all the right things, you're growing the right relationships, one of those triggers happen. Sets you back 10 years. Sets you back two years, two months, two years. A long time. Now, here's the last one. Her people need to forgive, to be released, and restored to freedom. 
Now, you, now the thing is, most hurting people are the ones crying at the altar and stuff. No, most hurting people, you will never know they're hurting. They don't know they're hurting. But in their mind, they process everything all wrong. Motives of people, hearts of people, people's character. We need to see each other the way Jesus sees us, right? We've talked about that, right? We need to love each other the way Jesus loves us. We need to love the way he loves. We need to give what he gives. We need to fight for people. We need to fight for If you're broken somewhere inside, there is always a trigger. There is always a switch. The devil can flip. When he flips, he's going, you're out of the race, Jack. You're out of the fight, Jack. You're back on the sidelines. You're... Why does God want to heal us? Why does he surface these things? Because he has a purpose for us. And the first purpose he has for us is to be healed. To be whole. We want to jump to join the ministry. So we have self work. We want to jump. And maybe God says, I'll give you that ministry when you're ready, Jeff. Right now, you've got time to grow yourself. You've got time to heal. Because there's buried anger there. There's buried hatred there. And of course, it's everybody else's fault. It ain't your fault. It's everybody else's fault. But at the end of the, the, end of the day, Jesus don't really care whose fault it is. You know what Jesus wants to do? He wants to use it. He wants to use it. We've been through the things we've been through for a reason. And I want to prove that here in a minute. Now, about healing. Ready? John 20, 23. Shelly, read that, baby. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. What is what he's talking about here is the very thing that we have been victimized by, we will become if we don't forgive. This usually isn't really about forgiving this, forgiving yourself. And when you forgive people, when you forgive them, as you get 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4, praise be to God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts all of us in our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble or with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. God wants to heal you so he can use what he healed in you to heal somebody else. Seriously. You can't give what you don't got. You can't take somebody somewhere you've never been. You can try. You can try. But you're probably going to hurt them, and you're sure you're going to hurt yourself. Because you think you can give them all the right answers. And by the you know, some of us have been through enough stuff and we've got enough wisdom about how the Holy Spirit works, we've got discernment. We can help anybody. We can help about everybody. But you know who we can't help? You help yourself. And then you gotta go, well, how can I help everybody else? But I'm not doing it. Man, does that make me a hypocrite? Does that make me a liar? No, it just means that God's got to finish something he started in. But here's the problem with those people. Jeremiah 31, 34. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. If Jesus can forgive us, if God can forgive us, what right do we have not to forgive ourselves? Or forgive somebody else but, but ourselves. My biggest problem is not forget, getting people to forgive other people. The biggest problem is getting people to forgive themselves and move on. Because we want to stay there. We want to stay guilty. We want to stay hurt. We want to stay angry. We want to punish ourselves. All, we're doing, all you're doing is destroying... God's purpose for you. It's terrible to watch this happen. Um, so let me ask you again. Know thyself. Know thyself. Do you know yourself? Does anybody know that these things, these 15 things, play out in most people's lives every day and we don't even know it? But once you're wise to them, you'll see them. Check, check, check. So immediately I know who I need to love on. I know how I need to love on them. I'm pretty sure even if they never told me their story, I know where it's coming from. People think, uh, oh man, wait, how do you know, Jeff? How did you know? Well, you told me. No, I didn't. Yeah, you did. That's what I'm looking at. God has showed me my spirit. God, I've been taught to recognize these things. Not to say I'm better than somebody. You know what? I'll share my heart. Why does God let me see these? Well, you want to love them. You want to put them on the right path. But do you know yourself? All of the emotional things in the emotional realm directly affects the spiritual realm and vice versa. It shapes how we see and understand. Most people cannot see themselves and they don't understand themselves, but we think we do. But, how, but this shapes how we see and understand God, Jesus, love, and even your destiny. If you've been done wrong and you're still caught in your hurt, you don't have a destiny. You just want to die. Right? You just want to die. You want it over. You, you wish you were never born. You hate yourself. If God, if all these things have gone wrong, you're angry with God. Right? This, this is the truth. Hey, with these emotional things shape how we see God. 
They shape how we see. They shape how we see love. I can't trust love. People, all people have ever done is hurt me. All people have ever done is walked out on me. I, my mama did it. My daddy did it. And by the way, those things, when you're always thinking about them, you make these prophecies happen. That's what hurt. That's what those 15 things. Those 15 things were. You make your relationships fall apart. You make the th the very thing you say you hate, the very thing you say you won't become, you become those things emotionally. You are the one that does that to yourself. But we don't know that. We think it's Forrest or Shelly or that, that ex-wife or whatever, that parent. If we don't understand these things can destroy, sabotage, create dysfunction in our earthly relationships and our heavenly relationships. Everybody good with that? So I'm going to ask you again, when I went over those 15 things, did you say this to yourself? Did you ask God to say, if, if this is me, if this is happening in my life, to show me if not? Or is it just something I have wasted 30 minutes doing? Let now, these are my closing thoughts. We need a church. Listen to me. We need a church. Of healers. Okay? Every church has a bunch of healers, but most of them aren't healed. We need a bunch of we need a church of healers who have been healed. We need a church of Christians who understand the healing process. We need a, a church of Christians who can lead others to the truth and set them free and give them freedom and healing. We need a church of Christians who recognize its true power and spirit. Most Christians and most churches do not know their true power and spirit. So a lot of times you might so so but if you if you're with me so far, you might say, so Jeff, explain it to me. What does what we talked about today, why does these things happen in our lives? Where is my true power and spirit? And can we get this on? Um, whoever, um, I'm not sure which one it is. Four. Four. Yeah, you turn, turn this to off. But take this one off. There yeah, we go. there we go. Um, I'm going to show you a video clip here. This is from that King Arthur movie. You guys, I told you it was a good uh, movie I like a lot. Legend of the Sword. This is one of the closing scenes. This movie was made before King Arthur became king. Okay? All right, before he became king, he's, and what you're going to see in this clip is he's fighting his darkness. He's fighting that thing that tried to kill him. He's trying. He's fighting that thing that destroyed his life. He is fighting that devil, that evil, that darkness, and, and that caused all his pain, all his hurt in his life. He's fighting. 